Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I am your host, Isaac Longworth, and today's saint is named Saint John Nepomucene. Now, don't feel bad if you've never heard of St. John Nepomucene before. He's not a very well-known saint, not exactly a famous one just yet. But I think that he is the perfect saint to talk about today. I just got back from New York City. I'd never been there before. I had just flown in. And uh, once I flew into New York, I decided to take a little bit of a look around the neighborhood where I was going to be staying. And I happened to fall upon a church called St. John Nepomucene. It was the very first Catholic church that I saw. And I thought that was pretty cool because I was preparing the show. I was getting ready to talk about him. And I walked into the church. And just as I was walking in, Mass began to start. So I was able to start off my first day in New York with Mass at the church of St. John Nepomucene. And honestly, I saw that as a bit of a sign from God that he was, in fact, the saint that should be featured today. In the middle of New York, never being there before, in the midst of all the churches and all the neighborhoods I could be in, I found the church of St. John Nepomucene. So I think he's a saint for today. He's an inspirational saint, and he really deserves to be more well-known. He was born in a village called Nepomuk, which is in modern-day Czech Republic. He was born in the year 1340, and his father was the mayor of Nepomuk, and he was raised in a Catholic family. Now, we don't know too much about John's childhood, but when he was a young man, he went to school at the University of Prague, and John studied theology and canon law there. Now, canon law, that's not the study of canons uh, like that are used as weapons. Canon law is actually a term used to describe the law of the church. So the Catholic church has its own legal system, its own laws, its own rules that regulates many different things that happen within the life of the church. So for instance, in canon law, there are rules surrounding sacraments, who can do them, how they can be performed, where they need to be performed. Um, There are certain rights and duties of clergy, of religious, of monks and nuns and lay people, uh, how they're supposed to live their lives. There's even people called canon lawyers. So the church has lawyers who are called on as experts to deal with cases where the law of the church has been broken. So for me as a seminarian studying to become a Catholic priest, I have to study a certain amount of canon law while I'm in class. And my professor, my teacher, is a canon lawyer. He deals with legal cases in the church pertaining to canon law. So John was studying to be one of these canon lawyers. He was studying that at the University of Prague. And at the same time as he was studying to become a canon lawyer, he was studying to be ordained a priest. He felt a call from the Lord to serve him as one of his priests, particularly as a priest who is well-versed in the laws of the church and is able to defend those laws in court. So John eventually achieved a doctorate in canon law, a really smart guy, and he even spent some time studying in Italy. But after he was ordained a priest, the Archbishop of Prague, he recognized that this young priest was a really smart guy. He recognized how brilliant he was when it came to the workings of canon law. And the bishop realized that this priest could be a really useful man in the diocese working as one of his legal advisors. And so Father John was selected to be the Vicar General. The Vicar General was this really prestigious position. Uh, It was basically the right-hand man of the bishop. So Father John was always uh, supporting the bishop. He was acting in his authority in certain cases, working to protect the legal rights of the church in that area. Now, he was the chief administrator of the diocese. He was working under the bishop to make sure that everything ran smoothly in the church. All the priests were doing what they were supposed to do. All the monks and nuns were doing what they were supposed to do. All the churches were running well. Uh, But Father John wasn't just a lawyer working in the archbishop's office. He wasn't just doing administrative work. He also had a very pastoral heart. He had a heart to serve the people as their priest. He didn't want to become a priest just to be a lawyer. 
but he wanted to proclaim Jesus. And so he preached at different churches. Uh, He organized funds and charities to take care of the poor. He heard a lot of confessions. So he, he worked out his ministry as a priest in so many different ways in the diocese. One of the things that Father John was known for was hearing confession. Now, one of the people who came to Father John for confession a lot was the queen of that country, Queen Joanna. She was the wife of King Wenceslas. And uh, when I heard the name King Wenceslas, I thought to myself, is this the same king from the Christmas Carol? You know, that famous Christmas Carol, Good King Wenceslas, is this the same guy? Well, it's not the same guy. This King Wenceslas is actually not a good king. And we'll see more about why that is as the story goes on. But his wife, Queen Joanna, was a faithful Catholic, and she wanted to come to confession often. And so, over time, she grew to really trust Father John. In her confessions with him, she benefited from his advice that he gave her on how to avoid sin, how to grow in holiness. And so, eventually, she took him on as her regular confessor. So, that meant that she only went to Father John for confession. Now, this is a common practice to take on a regular confessor. Basically, this means that since the priest is hearing your confession over and over again, he's able to kind of track your spiritual journey over a long period of time. You're not just going to all these different priests and they're hearing you for the first time. The priest is able over time to learn what your common weaknesses are, what your common sins are, so that he's able to give you better advice. If you can think about it as an analogy, if you were to go to a different doctor every single time with whatever your health condition is, they're not going to be able to give you the care that you need. But if you go to one doctor and he's able to track your health over a long period of time, he'll know your history, he'll know your medical background, and he'll be able to actually address the health problem. And so it's a similar thing with a priest, which is why Queen Joanna decided to take Father John as her regular confessor so that he could help her long-term with her spiritual life. But there was a problem looming on the horizon for Father John that he didn't know was upon him. Because the king, King Wenceslas, was suspicious of his wife Joanna. He had this suspicion that she was having an affair, that she was being unfaithful to him with another man. And so in a jealous rage, he accused his wife over and over again, are you being unfaithful to me? And she maintained that she was innocent of any of that, but he didn't believe her. King Wenceslas grew more and more convinced that Joanna was lying to him. But how could he figure out if she was telling the truth? How could he get to the bottom of this story? Well, then an idea struck him. King Wenceslas knew that his wife regularly went to confession with Father John of Nepomuk. And he thought to himself, well, he knows her darkest secrets. He knows her sins. If she was cheating, Father John would know. So I'll get the answer out of him. And so he went to Father John and demanded that he tell him exactly what his wife had been up to. But when he asked the priest to reveal the sins that Joanna had confessed, Father John refused. You see, Father John knew that in canon law, there was a rule called the seal of confession. The seal of confession. And this meant that the priest was not allowed, under any circumstances, to expose the sins of a person who has confessed. It is literally the highest form of secrecy in the world. When, uh, when we were studying canon law in our seminary classes, we read this law, and this is what it says. The sacramental seal is inviolable. Therefore, it is absolutely forbidden for a confessor to betray in any way a penitent, in words or in any manner and for any reason. So it doesn't get much clearer than that. The priest cannot betray any penitent who comes to him in confession. And there's a reason for this. This is to protect the identity of the penitent, which is the person who's confessing their sins, so that the person can feel completely free to come to confession with any sin that they've committed, knowing that that sin is going to be known by only the priest and God alone. 
that their secret will not be shared with the world. This is an extremely important part of the sacrament of confession. And you can see why the church has this rule, because if people thought that their sins would be revealed to other people, that would make them even more afraid than they maybe already are to go to confession. And so in order to protect the sacrament, in order to protect its integrity, the church has this seal of confession, which no priest is allowed to break. And so Father John told the king that he would never tell him what his wife had shared in confession, that that was between her and God, and that King Wenceslas had no business asking what sins she had committed and what she had told the priest in confession. Now, King Wenceslas was not the kind of man who was used to being told no, and he was furious. He was angry that this priest was keeping his wife's sins a secret. And so he increased his threats and his pressures against Father John, but he wouldn't budge. He knew that even though he was the king's subject, that he owed obedience to God and his church first, and that King Wenceslas did not have power to do whatever he wanted, that he didn't have authority over the church. Father John knew that he needed to stay true to what the laws of the church said, even if the king was putting pressure on him otherwise. Now, around the same time as this controversy was happening, John got into yet another sticky situation with the same king. Because a local abbot, who was uh, the head monk of a local monastery, had died. And the king had made it clear to everyone that he didn't want a new monk to be elected abbot after the old one had died. Now, the reason that the king wanted this is because he wanted that monastery for his own purposes. And so if there was no abbot for the monastery, the monastery would have to close down and the monks would have to abandon their property. And then the king could swoop in and use that land for his own purposes. Once again, King Wenceslas was trying to bully his way around, abusing his authority as king to try and get the church to do what he wanted. And so he didn't want any new abbot to be elected at that monastery. But when the abbot died, the monks elected a new abbot anyways. And because Father John was the vicar general, remember, he's the right-hand man of the bishop, he's acting in his authority, it was his role to confirm the new abbot, to make that abbot official according to the rules of canon law. Now, Father John had a decision to make. He could ignore the rules and he could let the monastery be taken over by the king for his own purposes. He could allow the church's authority to be surrendered over to King Wenceslas so that their property, their monastery would belong to the king, or he could do what he knew was right, confirm the monk's election, confirm the new abbot, and risk angering the king even more, who was already looking for an opportunity to get back at him for keeping the queen's secret. And so Father John decided to confirm the new abbot. In direct violation of the king's wishes, he confirmed the new abbot because he knew that the church had laws that needed to be upheld. Because it was important for him to remind King Wenceslas that even though the king had power over the country, had power over the laws and the rules of the nation, King Wenceslas did not have power over the church, did not have power and authority in canon law. Father John knew that the king of the church is Jesus, Jesus alone, and we need to be obedient to his laws first, even if that means making earthly rulers angry. And indeed, it did make King Wenceslas very angry. This was the final straw for the king. He had not only refused to betray the secrets of Queen Joanna in the confessional, but now he had confirmed this abbot against the expressed desires of the king. And so he had Father John arrested and thrown into prison. He was enraged that this priest dared to go against the king himself to uphold the laws of God over the king's own desires. And so while he was in prison, Father John was interrogated. He was threatened. At one point, they even tortured him by setting his sides on fire with torches, trying to get him to change his decision about the new abbot of the monastery 
and also trying to get him to betray the secrets of Queen Joanna that she had shared with him in confession. And to all of these demands, John refused to comply. He refused to go along with the king's evil commands. Despite his pain from being tortured with fire, despite his fear of death, he did not share a single sin that Queen Joanna had told him in confession. He maintained over and over again, despite the interrogation that he was going through, the truth that the king did not have authority over the church. That he, Father John, was to be obedient as a priest to God first and the king second. And when the king saw that John was not caving in, was not giving in to his demands, that he was resisting the torture, that he was resisting his threats, he was filled with so much fury that he ordered that the priest be executed. And so his soldiers tied Father John up and gagged him so that he couldn't speak to anyone about the injustice of why he was being killed. And he was led through the streets to a bridge overlooking a mighty rushing river. And at the command of the king, the soldiers picked up Father John and threw him over the side where he fell into the waters below and drowned. Now, at the surface level, looking at Father John's life, maybe you're thinking to yourself, his death doesn't make any sense. Especially if you're not a Catholic or you don't really understand the meaning of, of confession, you might be wondering, well, why didn't he just tell the king some of the sins that his wife had committed? It would have saved his life. He wouldn't have been tortured. He wouldn't have been thrown into prison. What did Father John gain by protecting the queen? Well, here's why. Father John Nepomucene knew the importance of the sacrament of confession. He knew that it was worth his very life to protect it in its entirety, including the strict secrecy that the church called for. He knew that as Catholics, confession is the main way that God forgives us of our sins when we turn to him in repentance. In John chapter 20, verse 23 in the Bible, Jesus told his apostles, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And so they were given the power through Jesus to forgive sins. And they passed that on to their successors throughout history, which is why priests nowadays are still able to have the same power to forgive sins through the sacrament of confession. When the sinner shares his sins with a priest, he's actually confessing them to God. And it's in the authority of Jesus that the priest is able to say, I absolve you of your sins so that they are completely forgiven. The church wants people to come to the sacrament often, especially when people have committed a gravely serious sin, because confession is the way that we are reconciled with God, that we have our relationship with him restored. But many people are afraid. They're afraid to share their deepest, darkest secrets with a priest because, let's be honest, it is scary. It's tempting to keep our sins to ourselves. We don't want to share the wrong things we've done with others. I experienced this in my own life. There was a long time in my life where when I was going to confession because I was raised Catholic, I would hide some of my sins. I wouldn't tell them all because I was embarrassed. I didn't want the priest to look down on me. I didn't want the priest to judge me. I was worried about what he would think. So I know how scary it is to confess our sins. And that's why the church has such strict laws preventing priests from sharing what they hear there. So that they make it easier for people to come without being afraid of being exposed. And knowing this was part of the reason why one day I was able to actually make a good confession. I knew that my sins would be heard only by the priest and by God. And so with that knowledge, I was able to work up the courage one day to make a good confession. After years of lying in confession, of hiding some of my sins, when I was in university, I was able to go to a priest and really share my heart. Really say every single embarrassing sin that I had been keeping in the dark. And when I did that, I experienced the power of having my sins forgiven. 
I experienced the love and the mercy of God. I began to cry in the confessional, experiencing the love of Jesus. I knew that my sins had been wiped away, that I had been washed, that I had been purified through this beautiful sacrament. And I did it because I knew that other people would never know my sins that I had shared with that priest. I knew that I could bring them to Jesus in secret where he was waiting to forgive me. So that's why St. John Nepomucene was willing to die rather than expose the sins of the queen. He knew that he could never compromise on the church's laws about confession because if he did so, he would destroy the trust of the sacrament. He would create an obstacle for people in receiving God's mercy and forgiveness. Now, the situation that St. John was facing is not an old thing. Recently, Australia has passed a law that forces priests to disclose the crimes of their penitents. Now, the good bishops and priests of Australia have refused to comply, even if it's now illegal to do so. And they're willing to face the consequences for breaking that law by saying, we will not share the sins that we hear in confession, no matter what the government tells us to do. And here in the United States, California, the state of California has been trying to pass similar bills, trying to pass bills that would force priests to betray their penitents. And so maybe this means that very soon there will be brave priests in Australia and California and other parts of the world that, like St. John Nepomucene, will have to face serious consequences from their governments for refusing to break church law, for refusing to violate the sacrament of confession. And we have to pray for our priests that they would be strong and courageous in standing with what the church teaches. But for all of us, no matter where we live, no matter if we're priests or seminarians or lay people, if we want to become saints, we need to recognize, like St. John did, the power of the sacrament of confession and to take advantage of it. Because none of us are perfect. I sin, you sin, we all sin. We all need to have our relationship with God restored. And so God wants us to come back to him. And he's given us this awesome sacrament, this beautiful, amazing sacrament of confession to make that possible, to make that reconciliation happen. And so if you want to become a saint, form a habit of going to confession often. Go often, make it regular, even if it's difficult for you at times, even if you struggle with a fear of being judged or yelled at, if you are worried like I was about telling your sins to a priest and being embarrassed by them. The priest is supposed to minister God's love to you. He's probably heard all the sins that you're going to commit already. He's not going to be shocked by you. He's not going to be disturbed by you. He's not going to yell at you. Just go to confession and allow the Lord Jesus to forgive you through the ministry of the priest. I know what it was like to be stuck in sin. I know what it was like to be far from God to be avoiding confession because of fear. But once I went, I experienced the mercy of God and the power of his forgiveness like I have never experienced before. And so I really do encourage you, go to God, go to confession, and have it all washed away. You will not regret doing so. So let's pray right now to St. John Nepomucene that we would become saints who value confession like he did. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. John, you refused to allow the governments of your time to usurp the authority of the church. Help us to recognize, like you did, that before we owe obedience to any earthly power, any earthly ruler, we owe our obedience first to God. And we must follow his laws that he has given us in his church above any other law. St. John, help us to have a deep love for the sacrament of confession, to take advantage of it often, to receive the mercy of God through this beautiful sacrament and to be reconciled with him. St. John Nepomucene, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.